Good day, everyone. So our topic for this week is about um, introduction to biochemistry. I am Dr. Erwin R. Abrancilio. So for our learning outcomes, first, trace the beginning of biochemistry. Second, show the connections of the different unified ideas, concepts, focus on studying biochemistry. And third, identify the different characteristics of living things. So this uh, module is divided into three lessons. So before we proceed to these lessons, let us have first a short introduction. So by uh, defining what biochemistry is. So it is an area of discipline that is concerned with the interaction of inanimate biomolecules and living organisms. When we speak of inanimate biomolecules, we are talking about the carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and fats, and as well as the uh, living organisms. So uh, with this, you have to revisit the characteristics of living things, which we are going to discuss later on, and how the biomolecules and energy form in an enormously complex and diverse hierarchy of life. So in short, um, biochemistry is the application of um, chemistry in the living system. So the, the ultimate goal of biochemistry is to explain all life processes in molecular detail. So unlike um, in organic chem or unlike um, biology, so it is the combination of the two. So we are going to um, explain the different life processes in the concept of uh, molecules or in the concept of chemistry. So because life processes are uh, performed by organic molecules, so you can also recall here the different concepts in organic chemistry, the discipline of biochemistry relies heavily on fundamental principles of organic chemistry and other basic sciences. So as I have mentioned, um, you have to utilize your knowledge in organic um, chemistry. So let us, uh, it is of no surprise that the first biochemists actually were organic chemists who specialize in the chemistry of compounds derived from living organism. So before, uh, there's no such thing as a biochemist, but um, we have different organic uh, organic chemists, those um, scientists who specialize themselves in studying organic chemistry. All right, so let us now begin with lesson one, historical highlights of biochemistry. So just like any other sciences, uh, we always start with the historical background of a certain science. So in this case, we are going to, to start with the historical highlights of biochemistry. Of course, this discussion is just a summary of the module that I have uh, given in our uh, CILID online platform. So let us begin with 1650 to 1680. Um, starting with the work of Robert Boyle and culminating in that of um, Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry. So uh, Boyle questioned the basis of the chemical theory of his day and thought that the, pro the proper object of chemistry was to determine the composition of substances. So in that case, uh, Boyle uh, started already with is thinking about um, the basic uh, chemistry. And uh, also, as we all know that Robert Boyle was uh, the one who uh, formulated the uh, gas law known as the Boyle's law. Um, his contemporary, Jan uh, Mayo, observed the fundamental analogy between the respiration of an animal in the burning or oxidation of organic matter in air. When we speak of analogy, it is as a sort of comparison, like for example, a uh, comparison of uh, respiration of an animal and burning or, or oxidation. 
of organic matter in the air. So organic matter uh, in that case is something that uh, can be burned. So that's why the term is uh, oxidation. So uh, then when Lavoisier carried out his fundamental studies on chemical oxidation, grasping the true nature of the process, he also showed quantitatively the similarity between chemical oxidation and the respiratory process. So when we speak of quantitatively, uh, that means that um, the scientists provided um, numerical data in order to prove his uh, claim. Uh, in this case, is the similarity between uh, chemical oxidation and the respiratory process. So that is why also uh, Lavoisier became the father of modern chemistry. So what we are talking right now is the development of the science of biochemistry, and I want you to, I want to show you that uh, biochemistry did not start as a biochemistry. So it started first with just the basic biochemistry, then organic chemistry, then biochemistry. So right now we are still in the in that part of uh, the basic biochemistry. Though in our modern times, no, uh, in in which we are uh, so much advanced compared to the different uh, explanation done by the scientists, and of course the different discussions that I am going to discuss later on. Uh, is also somewhat similar to what I am uh, talking and it is not that uh, advanced compared to uh, the modern times that we have right now. So photosynthesis was another biological phenomenon that occupied the attention of the chemist of the late 18th century. So why photosynthesis? Because uh, they, are, um, they are thinking on how plants uh, produce food with just the use of uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide. And of course, they do not uh, know that yet, no? the different chemical compositions in the process of photosynthesis. Because if uh, a certain scientist can be able to explain the chemical reactions in the photosynthesis process, so that means that that is already biochem because uh, photosynthesis is done by a living organism and the chemical reactions, if someone will explain it through uh, chemistry, is already biochem. No, but however, the explanation that they've done before um, is quite primitive if we are going to compare it to our modern knowledge. But but of course, during the time, it is already uh, quite excellent. So the demonstration through the combined work of uh, Joseph Priestley. Uh, John Eigenhaus and uh, Jen uh, Senebier that photosynthesis is essentially the reverse of respiration was a milestone in the development of biochemical thought. So as I mentioned, the flow of the development of biochem is uh, from basic to organic to biochem. So this time, they were able to conduct a certain uh, experiment that will prove that Photosynthesis is essentially a reverse of respiration, which is in uh, in the modern world, uh, we can already uh, show the chemical process of photosynthesis and then also the chemical process of uh, respiration, which is in actual, you know, the, the product of photosynthesis are needed in the as a reactant for um, respiration. And then the product of respiration um, is needed naman by the process of photosynthesis. So that's why um, Priestley and the other scientists said that it is just a reverse process of respiration, uh, the, that process of photosynthesis. So the illustration show how uh, Labusser carried out his fundamental studies. So of course, this is just uh, a simple drawing, but of course, um, this is based on the actual uh, experiment done by uh, the scientist. So in spite of these fundamental, uh, early fundamental discoveries, rapid progress in biochemistry had to wait upon the development of structural organic chemistry, one of the great achievements of 19th century science. Though 
in the previous uh, in my previous discussion before the 19th century there are some development in biochemistry however it is uh, quite difficult to to push forward since they lack the basic foundation and as we all know that along the process uh, that is why we have biochemistry right now it is because of the massive development in the science of organic chemistry that lead to the more uh, complicated exp explanation uh, on the um, uh, chemistry processes of uh, biological uh, system. So a living organism contains many thousands of different chemical compounds. So as we all know that there are you no know, in one organism, in our cell, in our tissues, in our uh, in 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 our body, there are uh, thousands of different chemical compounds. So we are we are uh, talking about these uh, different compounds in our body. It could be uh, inorganic compounds, and it could also be organic compounds. But of course, since we are talking about living organisms, there are a lot of uh, organic compounds that are inside our body or composing our body. So the elucidation of the chemical transformations undergone by these compounds within the living cell is a central problem of biochemistry. Of course, uh, uh, during this day, it is already uh, proven no, that uh, about this chemical transformation. So meaning to say that uh, in the modern times, this is no longer this is no longer a problem. However, during their time, it is one of the things that they are looking for, how uh, how can they be able to explain this chemical transformation? So chemical transformations, how chemicals or chemical compounds are um, done, no, are converted from one compound into another inside the living organism. So since there are different chemical compounds, uh, these chemical compounds can react to one another, forming another new compounds. So they are looking into the answer of that. So biochemistry has borrowed the methods and theories of organic and physical chemistry and applied them to physiological problems. So um, when we speak of physiological problems, these are the different problems in our uh, body functions or in the body functions of organisms. So they use... Um, they use the methods, they use the theories of organic and physical chem and apply it for them to be able to, to solve physiological problems. So in this case, progress in this path was at first impeded by a stubborn misconception in scientific thinking. Of course, um, again, this we are talking about the, the, the time the, um, in the history that is not yet modern. So that's why there is that term they use the the stubborn misconception but of course during the time it is it is not misconception no it was uh became misconception because uh, later on they found out what the truth is so that's why the term became misconception so it is the error of supposing that the transformations undergone by matter in the living organisms were not subject to chemical and physical laws that applied to inanimate substances and that consequently this vital uh, open close uh, no, a phenomena could not be described in ordinary chemical or physical terms. So just imagine that no. So they are saying that the these transformations that are done by matter in the living organisms were not uh, should not be subjected to the chemical and physical law. So it's it's a sort of exemption. No, so that's why it is it is a misconception. No, because um, they should not be uh, exempted to the chemical and physical laws. So that's why the term here is the the term a uh, misconception. So th that's why the um, they also use the term vital phenomena could not be described in ordinary chemical or physical terms. So we can uh, we can look back. No, why why these people are thinking like that? Because uh, in the ancient time or even in the medieval or uh, medieval time, so if they cannot be able to explain a certain uh, phenomena, no, so they always uh, associate that to 
let's say to superpowers or to um other beliefs that may not be subjected to scientific laws so that's why they're thinking like that so now um even in the modern times eh no um if there are certain diseases that we cannot uh explain because of lack let's say lack of knowledge or lack of opportunity to to consult a certain doctor so they they will just say na uh, ito pinagli sa ganito ito pinagli sa ganyan of course we have seen a lot of this documentary um documentary film uh, featuring different people with various diseases that uh wherein they failed to consult experts so that's why they are just saying that uh it is done by this and that okay so i'm just making an analogy so such an attitude was taken by a uh, vitalist who maintained that natural products formed by living organisms could never be synthesized by ordinary chemical means so it it is in association to that no so this is uh, the first laboratory synthesis of an organic compound. So the the next the next explanations would tell us that uh, it is possible, you no, know, that um, these different compounds are not um, exempted to the physical and chemical laws. You no, know, just like for example the the uh, synthesis of an organic compound urea. Okay, so what is urea? Urea is actually a product of our body, but uh, because of the expertise of uh, Waller, no, in 1828, they were able to produce artificially, uh, artificial urea by combining uh, cyanic acid and ammonia, leading into the formation of ammonium cyanate, leading to the formation of urea which is uh, the same as the properties of urea produced by the body, just like in the picture. No? So whenever we eat, there are certain uh, metabolic uh, pathways that will lead to the formation of urea. So this, um, uh, this vitalist no, I believe that this kind of processes cannot be uh, cannot be done synthetically and these are exempted to physical and natural laws. So just like what I have uh, told you a while ago. However, uh, Waller and the team were able to conduct an experiment producing urea in the process. However, no, uh, the vitalists did not give up. But what they've said is that they are arguing that urea was only an excretory substance a product of breakdown and not of synthesis. So still, they are having this defense that uh, it is not it is not a uh, a product of breakdown. No, it is a product of breakdown of breaking down the different chemicals, but not of synthesis. Because what they are saying is that um, if it is a synthesis, it is it is it it cannot be done. No. And uh, it is exempted to the physical and chemical laws. Now, uh, the success of organic chemists in synthesizing many natural products pours further retreats of the vitalist. So the urea is just the the starting, no, the start the starting line of uh, thousands of products, organic products that were produced synthetically. It is an uh, axiomatic in modern biochem that the chemical laws that apply to inanimate materials are equally valid within the living cell. And of course, no, uh, even in the modern times, we no longer uh, get what are produced by the by the living organisms, but we can actually synthetically do that in the laboratory. So, for example, um, instead of just drinking the the herbal medicine, let's say, uh, maglalaga ka ng dahon ng ganitong halaman, inumin mo. Of course, that uh, okay lang kung kagaling. No? However, they were able to extract 
that particular uh, chemicals in that leaves solely for uh, for the purpose as a medicine in a certain in a certain disease. So instead of drinking everything, why not just get what is needed by the body? So that's why we have synthetic medicine. Of course, um, out of topic natin yung uh, contest between no or the uh, the debate between which one is more effective between uh, synthetic and herbal medicine. Of course, it depends upon on the person, di ba? Uh, bahalan, bahalan ako si Niino. But then again, we are talking about the scientific basis of uh, of things. So, as organic and physical chemistry erected in uh, an imposing body of theory in the 19th century, the needs of physician, the pharmacist and agriculturalist provided an ever-present stimulus for the application of the new discoveries of chemistry to various urgent practical problems. So, um, since there are a lot of uh, organic products that they are that that they made, no. However, uh, however, um, the the job of this uh, of these people who are working on this particular branches of um, of chemistry, they they became ano, they became uh, an engine of change, no. So they uh, this time they. Uh, the physician, the pharmacist, the agricultural agriculturalist, no, provided an ever present present stimulus for the application of these new discoveries, and uh, with this, they were able to solve uh, some practical problems, particularly when it comes with the uh, uh, diseases. And then two outstanding figures of the 19th century, uh, Justus uh, von uh, Leibig and Louis Pasteur, no, were particularly responsible for dramatizing the successful application of chemistry to the study of biology. So Leibig studied chemistry in Paris and carried back to Germany the inspiration gained by contact with the former students and colleagues of uh, Lavoisier. So established at uh, Geisen, a great teaching and research laboratory, one of the first of its kind, and which drew students from all over Europe. Of course, uh, when uh, a person is expert during the time, so it, it is not yet enough that they were able to prove certain laws or certain theory or uh, formulated a lot of knowledge, but uh, they also established schools and in this particular uh in, particularly like big no he established a research laboratory so that uh, he can be able to share his knowledge with other people who are also uh, focusing in uh, chemistry so besides putting the study of organic chem on a firm basis uh, like big engaged in extensive literary activity att uh, attracting the attention of all scientists to organic chemistry and popularizing it for the layman as well. So one thing that is good in this uh, particular um, contribution of Leibig, he also uh, was able to influence the, the layman. No? So those, those uh, when you speak of layman in this particular um, explanation, these are the people who are not involved in science. Uh, they are not scientists. They are just common people. No? So Leibig described the great uh, chemical cycles in nature. He pointed out that animals would disappear from the face of the earth if it were not for the photosynthesizing plants. Since animals require for their nutrition the complex organic compounds that can be synthesized only by plants. So very simple explanation in in the modern times. However, these are actually great contribution already during their time. So that was a uh, live big you no know, conducting experiment. So in contrast with animals, green plants require for their growth only carbon dioxide, water, mineral salts, and sunlight. So the minerals must be obtained from the soil. And the fertility of the soil depends on its ability to furnish the plants with these essential nutrients. So in this case, uh, it is just being highlighted that 
uh, the that plants and animals need uh, nutrients, no? And the the product of that of animals are needed by the plants, and the product of plants are needed by the animals. However, soil is depleted by these materials by the removal of successive crops. So when we when we remove the the crops that are on top of the soil, we also can remove the important materials that are on the soil. So that's why uh, in agriculture they need fertilizers because in um, every time that they harvest, you no, know, they uh, remove the the roots from the from the soil. They also remove most of its um, nutrients. So that's why whenever farmers uh, plant another set of crops, so they add up uh, fertilizers. So Leibig pointed out that chemical analysis of plants could serve as a guide to the substances that should be present in fertilizer. Of course, these are already uh, done in the modern times. So that's why uh, the fertilizers that our uh, farmers are using are very effective. No? There are even fertilizers that that can uh, also kill the the different uh, pests in the in the particular crops. So agricultural chemistry as an applied science was thus born. So imagine no, in the pursuit of the development of biochemistry, even agricultural chem was uh, was born. So in his analysis of fermentation, uh, putrefaction, and infectious uh, disease, Alibig was less fortunate. Okay, so he admitted the similarity of this phenomena, but refused to admit that living organisms might function as the causative agents. So um, it is not his uh, expertise. So that's why the term is less fortunate. So uh, meaning uh, he was not able to explain further the different observations on uh, fermentation, putrefaction, and infectious uh, disease. So that's why it remained for Pasteur to clarify that matter. So in 1860, uh, Pasteur proved that various yeast and bacteria were responsible for ferments, substances that caused fermentation, and in some cases, disease. He also demonstrated the usefulness of chemical methods in studying these tiny organisms and was the founder of what came to be called bacteriology. So this was um, Louis Pasteur or Louis Pasteur uh, in what we called as pasteurization. So uh, it saved, it actually saved a lot of lives during uh, way back then because um, of the because uh, he, in the process, he was, he was able to kill the different uh, disease-causing yeast and bacteria from the, from the milk. So later on, uh, in 1877, pasture ferments were designated as enzymes. And in 1897, the German chemist E. Uh, Buckner clearly showed that fermentation could occur in a press... Uh, in the fresh juice of yeast, devoid of living cells. Uh, that one should be fresh, not fresh. So thus a life process of cells was reduced by analysis to a non-living system of enzymes. So the chemical nature of enzymes remained obscure until 1926 when the first cure, pure crystalline enzyme urease was isolated. So isolation of um, enzyme can be can be done, no, even in the modern, uh, especially in the modern times. So this enzyme and many other uh, subsequently isolated proved to be proteins, which had already been recognized as high molecular weight chains of subunits called amino acids. So as time goes by, we can see that uh, they were able to study and discover the different biomolecules in uh, a very specific manner. For example, the study about enzymes. So enzyme, enzymes are proteins. No? 
And for them to be able to study enzymes, they should have a vast knowledge about proteins and amino acid. Of course, in this case, uh, proteins. No. So the mystery of how uh, minute amounts of dietary substances known as the vitamins prevent diseases such as beriberi, scurvy, and pellagra became clear in 1935 when uh, riboflavin, uh, vitamin B2, was found to be an integral part of an enzyme. So one thing that are uh, being done by uh, scientists before, uh, the main target is to reduce the mortality rate, no, yung bilang ng, ng mga namamatay, when it comes with uh, the different diseases. So in this case, itong mga ganitong panahon, no, itong beriberi, scurvy, and pelagra, no, are diseases that can kill a lot of lives. And of course, uh, because of the discovery, no, that uh, there is this vitamin B2, uh, riboflavin, which is part of an enzyme that could also prevent diseases such as those that I have mentioned. So in 1929, on the other hand, the substance adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So uh, ATP is the, the usable energy of the cell. It was as isolated from the mast cell. So there are a lot of uh, ATP in the mast cell. Uh, ATP, uh, there are more ATP in those parts that are uh, always using um, energy, just like our uh, voluntary muscles. So subsequent work demonstrated that the production of ATP was associated with respiratory or oxidative process in the cell, which is later on, you know, in the modern times, um, it is true that there is what we call oxidative process in the cell, which is uh, considered to be as one of, uh, it is the mechanism that can produce uh, ATPs. It is actually the third stage no, in the cellular respiration uh, known as the oxidative phosphorylation that produces uh, the much ATP in the entire uh, cellular uh, respiration. So in 1940, F.A. Lipman proposed that ATP is the common form of energy exchange in many cells, a concept now thoroughly documented. No, ATP has been shown also to be a primary source, energy source for muscular contraction. So the use of radioactive isotopes of chemical elements to trace the pathway of substances in the animal body was initiated in 1935 by the two U.S. scientists, R. Ashodheimer and D. Rittenberg. So that technique provided one of the single most important tools for investigating complex chemical changes that occur in life processes. So this time they are now using radioactive isotopes. No, uh, Of course, isotopes, uh, we all know that uh, elements of the same atomic number but of different atomic mass. So just like for example, uh, in carbon, in carbon, no, um, carbon has an atomic number of six. So the isotopes of carbon, uh, 12, carbon 12, carbon 13, and car carbon 14. So that means that these are the isotopes of carbon. They are all carbon, but of different uh, atomic mass. So when we speak of radioactive, so they can easily uh, decay. No, these are chemical elements, and uh, they use that to trace the pathway of substances in the animal body. So that depends on the kind of pathway that they are using and the kind of isotopes that they will be uh, inputting inside the animal body. So at, at about the same time, other workers localized the sites of metabolic reactions by indigenous uh, technical advances in the studies of organs, tissue slices, cell mixtures, individual cells, and finally, individual cell constituents such as nuclei mitochondria, ribosomes, lysosomes, and membranes. So um, they are now into the metabolic reactions. No? They, are, they are working in a cellular level. Not just cellular level, but organelle level because we're talking about ribosome, lysosome, uh, nucleus or nuclei, mitochondria. So the cells are very small, but the organelles are much more smaller because these are inside the these are inside the the cell. So, but but imagine they can be able to work, you no, know, 
in the in those particular uh, parts of the cell. So the use of uh, not this one. So in 1869, a substance was isolated from the nuclei of past cells, no nana, and was called nucleic acid, which later proved to be deoxyribonucleic acid or the DNA. But it was not until 1944 that the significance of DNA as genetic material was revealed when bacterial DNA was shown to change the genetic matter of other bacterial cells. So they're just thinking that nuclei are just regular kinds of protein, no? And uh, nucleic acid are just, uh, are just uh, regular uh, protein. So that's why the term, the term is nucleic acid because it was found in the nuclei of past cells. Yeah, it is nucleic acid. But of course, you can also associate that to the location of the nucleic acid, which is in the nucleus of the cell. Now, um, it, might, it it became more clear, no, when uh, uh, within that decade of discovery, um, Watson and Crick were able to create uh, the double helix structure of the DNA. So providing a firm basis for understanding how DNA is involved in cell division and in maintaining genetic characteristics because the double helix that they made you know, show also the different parts of the different parts of the of the DNA you no know? the nucleotides the phosphate group the sugar and so on so advances have continued since that time you no know, with such landmark events such as the first chemical synthesis of protein the detailed mapping of the arrangement of atoms in some enzymes and the elucidation of intricate mechanisms of metabolic regulations, including the molecular actions of hormones. So until such time, no, uh, in the modern times, it is it is much more advanced. No, uh, of course, um, it is more advanced because of the tools, because of the different uh, machines, gadgets, computers. No, that uh, we can be able that the scientists can be able to use in order for them to, to study the molecular level. No, This time, it's no longer just atomic level. Uh, it is, or cellular level. No, Because a while ago, I uh, explained to you the, the, the study, no? uh, the different met metabolic study on the organelles of the cell. However, in the modern times, it is now in the molecular level you know, because of the, the different uh, mechanisms, the different uh, machines and gadgets that they can, tools that they can be able to use in studying uh, living organisms. So now, that was the historical background. No? So... From the ancient time up to the modern times, we can see that there is really that a uh, development of chemistry. Actually, if you are go, if you're still going to go back, you no, know, in time, so it, it started first with the search for uh, elixir of life, the and then as well as the as as well as the the metal that can that can convert any metal into gold no um th those are the the alchemist al alchemist believe and then after that uh, other people separated from the alchemy and practice chemistry and then then the the different concepts that i told you a while ago about the historical background of the development of chemistry or biochemistry. Okay, so this time let us talk about uh, the unified ideas of living matter or biomolecules. So under this, we are going to discuss uh, the chemical composition of living matter, nutrition, digestion, blood, metabolism, and hormones, and then genes. So let's talk first about the about proteins. No? Proteins are fundamental to life, not only as structural elements such as collagen 
and to provide defense as antibodies against invading destructive forces, but also because the essential bifatalists are proteins. So the one that you can see on the right are um, illustration. This is the illustration of amino acids and proteins. So you have there the individual amino acid. Then later on, they were able to form a chain because of the peptide bond. And then the peptide bond intertwined together, forming a much more complicated uh, protein. So there are different structures of protein. And of course, we're going to discuss that specifically on our topic about protein. So the chemistry of protein is based on the researches of German chemist Emil Fischer, whose work from 1882 demonstrated that proteins are very large molecules or polymers. So when we speak of polymers, these are chain of uh, monomer no? that built up of about 24 amino acid. So proteins may vary in size from small, just like insulin, with a molecular weight of 5,700 to very large molecules with molecular weights, weights of more than 1 million. So these are uh, composed of amino acid bonded by peptide bond and then forming complicated uh, intertwined and then uh, up to no, where in the molecular uh, weights could be more than 1 million. So uh, on the other hand, we have also carbohydrates. No? So what's the, what are some information about this? Now, carbohydrates uh, include such substances as, such as uh, sugar, starch, and cellulose. And the metabolism of carbohydrates became clarified during this period in an in elaborate pathways of carbohydrate breakdown and subsequent storage and utilization were gradually outlined in terms of cycles, such as that uh, found in the, the picture on the right. No, uh, You have there the Krebs cycle that happens inside the cell, particularly in the mitochondria of the cell in the process known as cellular respiration. So you can see there the uh, metabolic pathways, no, the, the breaking down of carbohydrates from uh, six carbon sugar to five carbon sugar or five C to four carbon sugar and so on and so forth. Of course, we are going to discuss further the details of such cycle in the uh, discussions along the way of the semester. So the involvement of carbohydrates in respiration and muscle contraction well, was well worked out by the 1950s, no? refinement of the schemes continue. And of course, for fats or lipids constitute the heterogeneous group of organic chemicals that can be extracted from biological material by nonpolar solvents such as ethanol, ether, and benzene. So the classic work concerning the formation of body fat from carbohydrates was accomplished during the early 1850s. So those studies and later confirmatory evidence have shown that the conversion of carbohydrate to fat occurs continuously in the body. So let us highlight that. No? Uh, carbohydrates can be converted to fats to be stored. So that's why even if you are uh, not eating uh, any fatty foods, but you are eating a lot of rice, a lot of bread, a lot of starchy food, this can also be converted to fats. So that's why one thing that can be I use in or one thing that you can do in order to at least um reduce the gaining of weight is to minimize the intake of uh sugar. Okay, so this one on the right are fatty acids saturated fatty acids such as those fats produced by uh, animal no animal these are animal products and the unsaturated fatty acids that are usually produced by 
plans. Of course, uh, when we speak of uh, health, you know, healthy, which one is healthy? These are the unsaturated fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids. So on the other hand, nucleic acids are large complex compounds of very high molecular uh, weight present in the cells of all organisms and in viruses. So even virus has uh, nucleic acids, so they have DNA. Uh, they are of great importance in the synthesis of proteins and in the, trans in the transmission of hereditary information from one gener generation to the next. Originally discovered as con constituent of cell nuclei, um, the one in the past cell, it was assumed for many years after their isolation in 1869 that they were found nowhere else. So this assumption was not challenged, challenged seriously until the 1940s when it was determined that two kinds of nucleic acid exist, the DNA and the RNA, which are found in the cytoplasm of all cells in, in most viruses. So that's why there are a lot of knowledge uh, that we have when it comes with the DNA and the RNA. So the, the one on the right is the are the pictures of RNA and DNA as well as um, the difference between the two. So first, we're going to discuss that further as we go along the semester. So another one is nutrition. So biochemists have long been interested in the chemical composition of the food of animals. So they are interested because they are, they are looking into how the, the food of animals help the animals in their daily life, how uh, food are converted into energy and how this energy are utilized in the body. So all animals require organic material in their diet in addition to water and minerals. Well, of course, yes, no? So this organic matter must be sufficiently in quantity to satisfy the calo caloric or energy requirement of the animal. So that's why uh, each, you know, each organism has this caloric um, requirement. You know? And then the food that we eat should be sufficient in order to maintain our body functions. You know? Within certain limits, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins may be used interchangeably for this purpose. So meaning we can eat in a certain limit, carbs, fats, and protein. You may eat more carbs or more fats or more proteins in that matter. No. In addition, however, animals have nutritional requirements for a specific organic compounds. So for example, uh, you would like to to develop your your fats in the body or or to gain fats in the body or uh, gain more proteins or carbs. So there are specific nutritional requirements. So certain essential fatty acid, uh, fatty acids by the way are the building blocks of fats. About 10 different amino acids um, known as essential amino acid and vitamins are required by many higher animals. So we are included in this higher animals. So the nutritional requirements of various species are similar, but not necessarily identical. So similar, but not identical, meaning to say one animal may need more carbs than the other. One animal may need more protein than the other. Thus, man and the guinea pig require vitamin C, ascorbic acid, whereas the rat does not. Okay, so but of course, when it comes with the amount, the size of the body uh, may vary. So that's why the the amount no may will also vary from one organism into another. So plant differs from animal in requiring requiring no uh, preformed organic material was appreciated soon after the plant studies of the late seventeen hundreds. So the ability of green plants to make all their cellular material from simple substances, carbon dioxide, water, salts, and source of nitrogen such as ammonia or nitrate was termed photosynthesis. So 
aside from the curiosity in studying the nutrition of animals, they're also curious in the studies, no? in studying how plants uh, perform photosynthesis and how plants uh, manufacture their own food with just uh, the, the, the need of CO2, water, salt, and other source of ammonia or nitrate. So as the name implies, light is required as an energy source and it is generally furnished by sunlight. So the process itself is primarily concerned with the manufacture of carbohydrates from which fat can be made by animals that eat plant carbohydrates. Proteins can also be formed from carbohydrate provided ammonia is furnished. Okay, so yeah, so let us continue. So in spite of the large apparent differences in nutritional requirements of plants and animals, so we all know that the that there is a big difference between the nutrition of plants and animals. So plants are though plants are dependent on animals, but plants do not get uh, food from the from the animals. Unlike in the case of animals, we need plants in order for us to eat. So the plant manufactures all the materials it needs, but these materials are essentially similar to those that the animal cell uses and often handled in the same way once they are formed. So plants could not furnish animals with their nutritional requirements if the cellular constituents in the two forms were not basically similar. So meaning to say that, uh, that the plants and the animals can can utilize their own uh, products interchangeably, no? Parang palitan, no? The products of plants are needed by animals. The products of animals are needed by by plants. So though they deeper in the uh, nutritional uh, requirement, no, the cellular constituents in these two forms were not. Uh, may not be basically similar, but they need each other no, in order for them to survive. So meaning to say that um, though they differ in the, in the nutritional uh, requirements, but they can exchange products because they are uh, similar, yung tinatawag natin na cellular constituents. So let us now talk about digestion. No, So the organic food of animals, including man, consists in part of large molecules. Uh, the food that we eat, no, these are uh, broken down by the digestive system and then it is absorbed by the blood and delivered in the different parts of the body. Now, in that case, uh, for it to be absorbed by the by our body, they must be broken down into into molecular level. So in the digestive tracts of higher animals, uh, these molecules are hydrolyzed or broken down to their component building block. For example, uh, proteins are converted to amino acid, polysaccharides are converted to monosaccharide in case of sugar, uh, fats are converted into fatty acids. So in general, all living forms use the same small molecules, but many of the large complex molecules are different in each species. So these are the things that I've said uh, a while ago, no? that uh, two organisms may need the same dietary requirement but they may need different uh different uh molecules no something like that so an animal therefore cannot use the protein of plants or of another animal directly but must be but must first break it down to amino acid and then recombine the amino acids into its own specific uh, characteristic protein so the hydrolysis of food material is necessary also to convert solid material into soluble substances suitable for absorption. So that's the summary of the process of digestion. So that's why we need water uh, in the digestion because 
uh, it helps the materials to be uh, absorbed to become soluble substances that are that can easily be absorbed by our cell. Now, uh, let's talk about blood. No? So one of the animal tissues that has always excited, especially uh, excited special curiosity is blood. No? So blood has been investigated intensively from the early days of biochemistry and its chemical composition is known with greater accuracy and in more detail than that of any other tissue in the body, which is true, no? Whenever we, um, if we would like to analyze or to, to diagnose the a certain uh, disease of a person, so we we examine the blood. No, if we would like to determine whether uh, the person no has a problem in in its circulatory system, high blood pressure or low blood, we we get the pressure of the blood and a lot more. No. So the physician takes blood samples to determine such things as the sugar content, the urea content, inorganic ion composition of the blood, since these show characteristic changes in disease. So if the result is like this, what, what, is, the, no, what is the equivalent uh, disease? Now, uh, the cell, uh, when you speak of metab metabolism and hormones, no? The cell is the site of a constant, complex, and orderly set of chemical changes collectively called metabolism. Uh, metabolism is associated with a release of heat. So that's why when you metabolize more, if you have fast metabolism, um, you uh, release more heat. No, So mas mabilis kang pawisan. So the heat release in the same as that obtained if the same chemical change is brought about outside the living organism. Of course, we are going to tackle a lot no, more no, about metabolism in a separate discussion. So hormones, on the other hand, may, which may be regarded as regulators of metabolism. So regulators because uh, hormones no, are uh, can give signal to certain body parts to go on with metabolism. If needed. So there are three levels to be investigated when it comes with hormones. No, uh, the first one is physiological effects, chemical structure, and the chemical mechanisms whereby they operate. Actually, uh, one and two, no, one and two are already uh, mastered by a lot of scientists. So they uh, already uh, investigated physiological effects and chemical structure of hormones, but they find it difficult to study the third part, no, the chemical mechanisms whereby they operate. So let's talk about genes. No? So genetic studies have shown that the hereditary characteristics of a species are maintained and transmitted by the self-duplicating units known as genes which are composed of the nucleic acid and located in the chromosomes of the nucleus. Then again, it is one of the fascinating chapters in the history of the biological sciences no? in the mid-20th century. Uh, their mode of self-duplication, the manner in which the DNA of the nucleus causes the synthesis of RNA, which among of its other activities causes the synthesis of protein. So the RNA and then the DNA are uh, responsible in the production of, in the synthesis of protein. So that is also the reason why uh, scientists thought before that proteins are, uh, that, that proteins consist or contain of the genetic material. Then later on, it was proven that it was uh, the DNA, it is the DNA that contains the the blueprint no it contains the genetic makeup of an organism so that's the capacity of a protein to behave as an enzyme is determined by the chemical constitution of the gene or the dna that directs the synthesis of the protein the relationship of genes to enzymes has been demonstrated in several ways all right 
So we are already done with the second lesson. So let us now move on to the third lesson, characteristics of living things. So of course, uh, I know that you are uh, you can easily recall this because these characteristics of living things were discussed in the junior high, in the senior high, um, as well as in other bio biology subjects in, in the college. Now, uh, living things exhibit locomoto locomotory motion. So meaning to say, one of the characteristics of living things is that they can move. Of course, their, their motion is a smooth motion. No, uh, Their motions are not um are not uh being command commanded by by a certain gadget no so they are not machines so animals are able to move as they possess specialized locomotory organs for example uh, earthworms can be able to move through the soil surface through longitudinal and circular muscles in our case humans we can be able to move because of our voluntary muscles Plants also move to catch sunlight for photosynthesis. The roots of plants are also moving under the soil to look for water. So living things respire. So one of the characteristics of living things is the uh, process of respiration. It is a chemical reaction which occurs inside cells to release energy from the food. So food are useless if they are not broken into, into molecular level and converted into energy. So transport of gases take place. Uh, that is the oxygen to CO2. So the food that is ingested through the process of digestion is broken down to release energy that is utilized by the body to produce water and carbon dioxide as byproducts. And the third one is living things are sensitive to touch and also of other stimuli as well and have the capability to, to sense changes in their environment. So we are a very sens sensitive to touch. So when somebody tap your, tap your shoulder when you are not looking, the tendency is that you will look back, okay? Or when you are uh, drinking hot, hot, uh, hot coffee, no, and then you forget that it is hot, so mapapaso ka, no, because uh, we can easily respond to stimuli because of our nervous system. Now, the next one is that they grow, no. So living things do not stay as a small organism, no. So there are different stages of development. Of course, uh, the growth of an organism is not necessarily that they will become enormous, no? that they will become monster-like. No? Uh, for example, um, butterfly. So there is a limitation in the size of a certain species of butterfly. But they start with, with being a caterpillar and then became, became a butterfly later on so one of the striking features is that living things are capable of producing offspring of their own kind through the process of reproduction wherein the genetic information is passed from parents to the offspring so whatever uh, mode of reproduction whether it is sexually or asexually the point is that the genetic makeup of the parents are passed on to the offspring Okay, so that's why you are look like your mother or you are look like your father or you are look like your grandparents. It is because of the genetic information that are passed on from one generation to another generation. Of course, because of the, because of the genes, because of the DNA found in our cell. They also acquire and fulfill nutritional requirements to survive through the process of nutrition and digestion, which involves engulfing, digesting, uh, and digesting the food. And then, of course, some living organisms are autotrophic, or meaning they can be able to produce their own food. So plants are autotrophic or autotrophs, and animals who, which are dependent to plants are known as heterotrophs. 
no so we cannot produce our own food but we are dependent on plants for uh, for food and then another one is that the digested food is eliminated from the body through the process of excretion so uh when we eat food we expect that we can also eliminate those um parts of the food that we failed to digest the bacteria found in our food no the fibers no so this will all be eliminated through the process of excretion um for example when you excrete no you can defecate no if it is uh if it is feces All right, so that ends our uh, discussion on module one. Thank you so much and see you in our face-to-face uh, -face classes. Thank you.